Hi everyone, I'm Rick Bensignor. Today is Tuesday, July 21st, and welcome to this week's In the No Trader show. Well, the market is pushing to new highs for the entire recovery move. The S&P is up about 20 points or so. Uh, gold is up significantly today, making a new high for its move. Um, and crude oil is up uh, over a dollar so. Uh, to somewhere near 42. So you're seeing risk on across uh, the markets as uh, Europe has seemingly put together, the European Central Banks have put together a stimulus package uh, for Europe. The markets like that, similar to what the U.S. has done in the past. And um, I think the fact that the markets here in the U.S. just have not been able to uh, decline at all are giving them a push to new highs on the move. We'll get to that as we get into the show. So uh, today, we're going to look at, we're actually going uh, to switch things up a bit. We're going to put the trader education portion right from the start. Uh, this week, we're going to uh, take a look at judging winners and losers. Then we'll do our markets overview. And uh, the last third of the show or so, we'll take a look at country and regional ETFs across the globe. So we'll look at uh, this, these 10 or so, which include Canada, Mexico, Brazil, uh, the top 50 stocks in Europe, kind of like their version of the Dow Jones. Uh, but for European companies, EWG is Germany, Japan, IFA is uh, Europe in the Far East, so it excludes the US. Uh, EEM is, of course, emerging markets. FXI is the biggest China ETF. Uh, EWA is Australia and INDA is India. So you get a pretty good look of uh, how the other country and kind of regional ETFs uh, look and give you some uh, possible trading ideas or, you know, how the charts give us uh, support and resistance and how to play them. So um, let me just give you this to contact me, Rick at InTheNoTrader.com. And of course, uh, check out In The No Trader. Uh, one of the things I want to mention, and we're going to do a special on this very shortly in the next uh, two weeks or so, but on August 1st, I am launching a brand new monthly report called 7-Eleven. It is designed to outperform the S&P. It is not trading oriented. It is more investing oriented. And the goal here is to uh, pick no more than seven of the 11 spider macro ETFs uh, to be in at any given time to outperform the S&P. My goal is to avoid the underperformers. And if you avoid the underperformers and give yourself exposure into the equal and outperformers, you will do better than the S&P. And that is the goal here. So we will do a special on that shortly, but know that if you go to InTheNoTrader.com, you can sign up already. We've had incredible signups for that report uh, at, already at this point with uh, a couple of weeks to go before we actually launch. And um, again, that is the 7-Eleven macro sector ETF report. Okay, so we'll go back here a second and let, let's talk about judging winners and losers because as a trader, this is one of the most important things you can do once you've gotten out of a trade and either the trade is going to be a winner or it's going to be a loser or it'll be a break even. And what I'm more concerned about um, than judging the winners is actually judging the losers because I think of losers, uh, I separate them into two categories. There are good losses and there are bad losses. Bad losses are trades that you really haven't done a lot of homework, you haven't paid attention to a lot, you've let things get away from you, you haven't necessarily stuck to the stop that you should have had from the moment you put the trade on or even before you put the trade on, you need to know where you're wrong and where to get out. So taking losses any way like that to me is a bad loss. But let's take a look at what's a good loss? Because some people will say, well, if you lose, you lose. What could be good about it? Well, sure, you lost money. But it's how you lost money and why you lost money. And um, did you set things up properly? So I'll give you an example. And I had written about this um, last week to In The No Trader clients in our weekly report, the Tactical Trader Report that comes out Wednesday nights. 
And I specifically talked about a trade I had put on myself uh, in S&P futures for my own account, whereby I shorted, um, I'm trying to remember the day, but uh, some bad news had come out. The, this was the day after the S&P uh, had gone from like up 1% to close down 1% a little over a week ago, I think. Uh, NASDAQ had gone from up about 2% to down 1% or 2% on the close. Um, and then the next day, they really whacked the market uh, early in the day. And then they had built in a lot of shorts. And the market started coming back. And I waited and waited and waited. And uh, just a couple minutes before the close, um, I shorted the S&Ps up against the level that I was comfortable doing, which was, uh, I think it was 3195 or so. It had gotten down to, if I remember, about 3115 or so. Uh, that day. So an 80 point bounce uh, before I sold them. And I sold them up into a resistance level where they had broken down through. And to me, the bad news was out. You guys know I've kind of been negative the market for the last couple of months, giving a range of 3000 to 3175 to lighten overall market exposure. And I've been unwilling to really chase after stocks up here. Uh, for a variety of reasons and the overall scenario that uh, I had had in place. So I lined up this trade. I uh, waited patiently to get the level I wanted to, and I sell them late in the day. And they, uh, at the five o'clock close in New York, so obviously the stock market, the New York Stock Exchange closes at four, but futures trade until 5 p.m. And at 5 p.m., um, they were a few points my way. I think I had actually shorted 31, I'm trying to remember, um, maybe 87s, and they closed at 31.84 that day, if I remember, at five o'clock. So I had a couple handles my way, but I, I definitely thought this trade could yield me anywhere from 20 to as many as 50 S&P points, just backfilling some of the short squeeze that had occurred um, during that day. So in the next day or so, I figured I didn't mind taking them home overnight. Uh, thinking that we could, um, you know, see a decent backfill of that 80-point rally. And when they opened up at 6 p.m., right, so every day S&P futures along with most major futures contracts, uh, such as oil, gold, silver, et cetera, um, close for only one hour a day, right? So they trade 23 hours a day. So they open at 6 p.m. New York time. And... At 6 p.m., I see that S&P futures gap higher by 20 points. Uh, so they were trading at uh, like 32.04. Um, and within just a couple minutes, they're already up at 32.14. And I'm down now 30 points and thinking, what the heck happened here? And I start looking through things and I see that um, one of the drug companies announced some positive results regarding a, a vaccine. Um, and, um, and of course the market liked that. So in that one hour that the market was closed, positive news came out that I certainly didn't expect to come out at that point in time to push the market well higher than I had thought. And, uh, I kind of trade in and out over the evening, but eventually when I go to sleep late at night, uh, I put a buy stop in a little higher and say, whatever this was, this is not what I anticipated. And you know, I'm gonna end up with a loss on this thing. Um, and at this point, we're getting close to the highest highs that the market had made since the March low, right? So we were, if futures were trading at uh, 32.15, then the cash would be about 32.25 and we were only a dozen points or so um, from the highest high. So I went to bed, I put in a buy stop, I wake up in the morning and sure enough, I see that I've been stopped out. And uh, I kind of eat my loss, but then I started analyzing what I did, um, how I lined up the trade with the known news at the time. You can't you can't know new news is going to come out, right? So at the time, I was actually uh, pleased with how I'd lined up the trade. And what I realized was I would have done the same thing 10 out of 10 times in a row. In other words, there's nothing I did wrong. Um, so I lined up the trade correctly. I waited for as many shorts as possible to be squeezed out that day. Huge 80-point rally. 
um, which for the S&P is obviously very significant, um, and sold them up into the breakdown point that had happened uh, the day before. So this to me is a good loss to take. This is a trade that I would line up and do every time. And um, as, if that news hadn't come out, I'm pretty sure I would have made no less than 20 points on the trade uh, the following day. But the news came out and altered the information to the marketplace. And thus, you know, my timing ended up being wrong. But the trade lineup was correct. And to me, that's a good loss to take. And think about when, when you, as a trader, once you get out of your trades, and this is part of the importance of, of keeping a journal, is noting, was it a good loss or was it a bad loss? Did you do your homework correctly? Would you have done that same trade again, given the opportunity? And in my case, I said to you, 10 out of 10 times, I would have done the exact same thing. So to me, the loss I took, yeah, it's a loss and it hurts, but it's a good loss. Uh, and I'd much rather take a good loss than a bad loss, even though dollar-wise, they might be the same amount of actual loss. Um, it's, it's how you do things and the psyche that sticks with you when you make trades of whether or not, you know, are you kicking yourself in your rear end? after you get out of something that you know you made big mistakes on and shouldn't do, or do you just accept it as, okay, that trade didn't work, move on, but it was the right thing to do. And that's, that's kind of what I wanted to leave you with today as far as a little portion of trader education is take a look at your winners and losers and um, how you feel about them and would you do them again and what mistakes you made. And in my case, I'd say, I really didn't make any mistake. Uh, new news comes out and, that's just, you know, in that one hour the market was closed, something changed and there's nothing you can do about it. So that's that for this week on that subject. Let's do our quick markets overview. So let's start off here with comparing last week to this week. And of course, on the right hand side is through last night's close year to date of the 11 macro sectors. And then on the left hand side was year to date through last Tuesday's close. And what we see is, let's see, three, four, five, six sectors outperformed by more than 1% this past week. And only two sectors underperformed by more than 1%, um, which are the ones with the red dots. And what this shows me first off is that you're getting a little more broadening participation um, in the market by the fact that you're getting some moves that are outperforming the S&P by more than 1%. From, look, six out of 11 means a little more than 50% of the sectors moved more than 1% above what the S&P moved for the week. So that, if anything, shows me that you're getting a little more broadening participation in the market, despite the fact that very interesting statistic I heard a couple days ago was that um, if you take away uh, the six largest FANG type stocks, right, the six largest capitalization stocks, um, what I call MaFang, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Take those six out of the equation. In the last two years, the S&P would be flat. So those six stocks are basically the entire price movement of the market. Everything else has washed each other out. So it still is this kind of big cap, big tech rally that is pushing the market higher. But I do like to see just from an overall point of view that if you're gonna have a bull market, you wanna see it expand a little bit um, and, and not be solely focused on the tech piece. Um, so that's that. Now, um, let's take a look at some charts. And let's start with, let me get you to the weekly S&P. So here's the chart we've shown you lots of times. And obviously with the market breaking out to the upside here, um, my call to have lightened up between 3,000 and 3,175, uh, I can pretty much say now is no longer the correct call. And we said we never went short, but we did say to generally reduce your overall portfolio exposure there. Um, and it had, if, if you look at how long we stopped into that level, it was certainly, it was five weeks. So we waited again patiently 
um, for the, on the rally to not sell before we at least hit 3,000. We used this zone in here. Uh, but now that we have broken through the downtrend line and now pushed above the propulsion exhaustion level, in fact, this is the propulsion full exhaustion level. So this goes back early to March. And what this model said is if you broke above 25, uh, 2454, you would get to the propulsion exhaustion level of 2715. Getting through that, you said you could get all the way up here to 3239. And now that we've pushed through that, I really can't make much case to still lighten up. So in other words, uh, and I've said this to the no trader clients, you can, if you wanna come back and put back on the exposure that you'd taken off, all you lost was opportunity cost in between where you had lightened up and where you put it back on. These are not true losses. You didn't lose money. You lost the opportunity to make money had you still been in it. But again, is that a good loss to take? Sure, because I would do this time and time again. This pattern of going from all-time highs down to the lows in March and the expanding pattern we saw suggested in every way, shape, or form that we should not go take out new all-time highs. And the way things are starting to look now, it does look like we can. Now, there is this gap here, and some charges will say, well, sell the gap. Um, I, I still can't tell you I love the idea of buying up here at 3270, but from a risk management point of view, if you want to put on the capital that you had taken off 100, 150 points lower, you certainly can. I can't argue with the fact that the market is not coming back down, uh, or at least hasn't yet. And when it did sell off a month ago, the clouds conversion line, this pink line here, caught four weeks in a row the lows. And that's first level support. So um, it does look like this is gonna go higher. It does look like you need to be buyers on a pullback. I still am concerned of you know coronavirus going forward for the second half of the year and that states can close up and that things can uh, you know come off. That being said, it doesn't look like there'd be reason now to come anywhere down into this part of the chart so uh, I've already identified for in the no trader clients where that, where that levels are, that zone is to come back in and buy when and if the market gives you a pullback to add new exposure. Um, and you can do what you want with what you have sold out of. Again, you certainly can come back in and just pay up. Obviously, the NASDAQ is way past what had been all-time highs. You know, it continually makes new all-time highs almost every day. Um, so it is way above where it had peaked previously. Uh, the S&P obviously hasn't. And what that's going to do, too, is have me probably remove these lines because they'll no longer be a significant factor uh, because we've broken out above the downtrend in Y. So X was the inverse of angle of Y, and these were multiples of X. Uh, those, I think, come out of the equation. So obviously, it looks like the market is hanging in there very well, moves higher, and investors apparently are looking well past um, the immediate effects and looking down the road to growth and other things that can come when, when the market uh, gets the support it has from the Fed. Um, let's just quickly take a look at, here's gold. Uh, this is a monthly chart of gold and just notice that this month happens to be an upside 13. If you look at the other 13s, that was upside exhaustion, that was upside exhaustion, uh, and that was downside exhaustion. So as much as I like gold, first putting on money now certainly comes with higher risk than any time in this upside move. Um, but that's the way the gold chart looks. And um, You'll know that, uh, well, some of you in the no trader clients know that last week, a full week ago, we got long silver. That was the trade of the week. Now you're seeing everybody's talking about silver um, on a breakout. We did this a week ago. Uh, silver is up uh, over 5% today. Uh, it's a very significant move, and you can see a breakout from all downtrend lines. There are no downtrend lines that can be drawn on this chart. Uh, any longer that you would not have broken above. So this is this is kind of a significant move in silver. 
Uh, you'll notice here on the bottom part of the chart that open interest is moving higher, uh, which is what you want to see in a market moving up. That means new longs are coming in versus new shorts. The shorts are obviously losing because we're on the highest level we've seen. So everybody who has sold it um, in the last couple months is a loser. And in fact, you have to go all the way back to, where are we? Somewhere 2014, last time silver was at this level. So uh, I, I had written uh, in the No Trader client saying that um, you can swap out of some of the gold that were long and, and put it into silver, just simply because silver to me had a better chance to, to move up. And uh, in the No Trader clients know where those targets are and what we're looking for. And the only other thing I'll show you before we get to the country charts is the dollar index. Now, of course, the dollar's been weakening, and that's good for the precious metals. You can see that um, you had the spike up in the dollar index in the U.S. dollar uh, into March, just the same time the markets across the globe were getting crushed, the equity markets, um, and even the precious metals markets at the time. And then the dollar peaked and it's been selling off dramatically since. And now this week is actually broken underneath the trend line from the January 18 secular bottom. And uh, I think we're, you're, you're at a real tipping point here where you could get a bounce shortly. We're on the last kind of, we're getting very close to last um, support levels here. But I think uh, that dollar bulls are on the verge of losing uh, the power that they've had for the last few years and that bears are in control. So again, you might get a bounce coming up shortly. 95.21 is the propulsion exhaustion level. Um, but look, the cloud has broken both. You're beneath the cloud, the lagging lines beneath the cloud. That kind of is already your signal. And we've been bearish the dollar and playing the metals on the long side uh, anywhere from weeks to months. Uh, we're also long uh, GDX, and uh, that's proven uh, that we're already up 30% or so on GDX because we, we bought the breakout, the seven-year breakout in that, and year 32 and change, and, and um, I think GDX is about 41 or so today. So that's that. Now, let's get to some of these country charts. So we're going to start with Canada. And uh, Canada made a slight new higher, a slight new high before everything fell apart this year. Made a lower low by just a little bit to 2016's low, and has come back. And uh, this has already filled its gap. So um, I would say that uh, there's a good chance here we're going to test this line again, and if it breaks through, it kind of has a, a clear shot for higher levels. Uh, All-time highs here were made, you can see, way back in 2007, uh, and it has not made higher highs since. So um, there's room for Canada to move. Realize that when you're trading any of these country ETFs, uh, they're buying, the, the portfolio manager is buying stocks in local currencies, so the dollar has a lot to do with this too. So the more the dollar weakens, the better uh, this is for um, those stocks. EWW, Mexico, much weaker, not even close to, take a look at this chart, not even close to uh, early highs this year. So in a pair trade situation, Mexico certainly could be on something on the sell side if you're looking to uh, do a pair trade of one country versus another. Uh, some people like to do Mexico versus Canada because they're both kind of what we used to call the you know, NAF part of the North American Free Trade Agreement. So take the U.S. out of it and you've got, uh, you know, potentially long Canada, short Mexico. That seems like that would work decently. You're going to have some type of resistance uh, here from prior lows. So this is, this is a much tougher chart to fully advance. But as long as it's above 2808, uh, what is that, 2808 on an uh, absolute basis, Mexico is still decent. Let's go to Brazil, the other major ETF for the uh, uh, northern and southern hemispheres, not including the U.S. So Brazil bottomed back in March like everything else. It also is well off the highs, both this year's highs, but as well as all-time highs, which I think was 2000. No, it's actually even before that, hold on, 
2008 made the all-time highs. Um, but you are above this 2008 low. You're certainly above the 2016 low when we made the low this year. So we do have kind of uh, a turn here. And I would say also in a general sense, you're into the price gap. But uh, as long as Brazil is above 26.26, I think it's a, it's a decent looking short. Fez is the Euro stocks 50. These, again, this kind of like the Dow Jones industrials of the uh, of Europe. It's the top 50 names of all European stocks traded. Um, getting closer to this year's highs, you look across here and you see the lows in 08 were virtually tested on the lows this year, bottomed on a setup nine count. This looks like uh, it, it has room another certainly few percent before it would even minimally hit a target. Um, and if it can ever get kind of above roughly that area, you get a, a much better breakout. So that's, I don't know, 40, 44 ish, give or take. Um, take out those highs, and then this thing can easily move another $7 or so before it gets to some resistance. Uh, EWG, Germany. Um, I got institutional clients into this a month ago, suggesting that um, Germany would outperform the, the S&P for the balance of the year. And so far, it has been outperforming. I like the way Germany's set up. I like this chart. And notice here, you've got gaps on either side. So island reversal type full bottoming pattern. Uh, this got, gap got filled. We're above there too. Uh, so I think there's up room, uh, upside to go. Notice that the downtrend line here also broke uh, in the last two weeks. So I, I think Germany looks decent. And as long as it's above about $25, it's good. EFA, EFA. Uh, this is Europe in the Far East, uh, so this kind of is a global type of uh, ETF that does not include uh, the, the northern and some southern, uh, or north, let's say, just say North America and South America. Uh, so you've got kind of the rest of the world besides it. Not as strong as some of the others, still hasn't filled this gap. Uh, as long as it's above 57 and a quarter, it's still a decent looking chart. It can move higher. It'll first have to deal with this gap. Um, and then resistance is between 70 and 75. Um, EEM, largest emerging market ETF. Uh, bottomed on a setup nine. We're on a setup nine now. Um, on the upside, so a little higher risk to first buying this now has not. Looks like, has, yeah, it has. Uh, not broken out above that trend line yet. Uh, so I'd look to be buyer on a pullback. Anything near 38 and a half, 39 is potential entry point. FXI China. Um, most, most of the price action is all in between what's gone on off of the 2018 high. Uh, that high is very similar to the 2015 high and all the way back to the 2008 high. So this is, you know, if I put up a long term moving average, let's see. Yeah, you've got a fairly flat long-term moving average. This, this one, um, I'm not saying it can't go higher. Uh, I want to see it stay above 40.70, but definitely not the best of uh, the ones to play. And then the last one we're going to have time for is, let's do India. Uh, does not have as much trading history. Major spike, you're getting right up to its 200-week moving average. Um, should have some overhead resistance here from all this. So also not a name. There are definitely better ones we saw. That's going to be it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Rick Bensignor, and this has been In The No Trader. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.